Good day and welcome to Building on the Rock. I am Pastor Chris Turner, the pastor of Rock Tabernacle Church in Milwaukee. And today we're going to continue with uh, a teaching that we began several weeks ago. It's entitled, When God Comes to Visit. That's when God comes to visit. We are in the midst, or I believe in the beginning stages, of a visitation, a great visitation of the Lord is in the earth today. I mean, for us right now, and it's going to increase and increase and increase, I believe, into the catching away of the church. But we're in, in the midst of it right now. It's, it's here. It's now. God has come to visit. And we need to know what that means and how to step into that, how to walk into that, and, and how to uh, receive all that God has for us in this time. Amen. We live in good times. These are good times to live in. We live in Bible times. We live in times that, that scriptures and certain things are being fulfilled in our day like never before. I mean, preparing for the second coming of Jesus. And it's a good time to be alive. And um, so we talked about the visitation of the Lord and when God comes to visit. And we were asking ourselves uh, the question, uh, uh, what happens? What can we expect when God comes to visit? And I'm just going to do a review. This is part five of that teaching. And I'm going to do a quick review, and then we'll get into the, uh, the continued teaching. And this will probably be the last teaching in this series. Like, I could go on, but uh, I just will stop it, I believe, it, unless the Lord says otherwise. I'll stop it after today. But uh, we said that a visitation of the Lord can be good or bad. Amen? A supernatural visitation of the Lord is not always good, not always bad. It can be good or bad, or it can be good and bad at the same time. And the example that we gave was the children of Israel in the book of uh, uh, Exodus. The children of Israel had been captives in Egypt for 400 years, and uh, it was time for them to be freed, their bondage to be freed. And the Bible says that God visited Egypt. He said, I've come to visit. I've come to visit them. And that when God visited the children of Israel in Egypt, well, some good things happened for them. Their bondage was uh, released. They were released from their uh, captivity. Their slavery was released. And they came out of Egypt with silver and gold, not one feeble one among their tribes. They were healed. They were wealthy. They were blessed. They came out and, uh, and, and delivered, protected in the, in the wilderness there and provided for. So that visitation of the Lord was good for them. But that same visitation of the Lord that, that, that he brought into Egypt destroyed the Egyptians. They were smitten with 10 plagues that, that crippled that nation. And also uh, at the parting of the Red Sea, the uh, Pharaoh's army was destroyed in the midst of the Red Sea by drowning. That was caused by the visitation of the Lord. Well, it, it was bad for them, but it was good for the, for, the, for the people of God, for the Israelites. And a visitation of the Lord in this day, in our day that we're seeing in the earth and we will see in the earth, there are some good things happening and coming our way uh, as people of God, and not so much so for the world. But we're not going to focus on what the world has coming. I'm focusing on what we have coming, what we can expect. Amen? That's what we've been focusing on. So we said it can be good and it can be bad, or, or good and bad at the same time, and like, like the children of Israel. And so I believe this visitation is good for us, but not so much so for the world, bad for the world. Also, we said the visitation can be missed. A visitation of the Lord can be missed. Our proof, our evidence was Luke chapter 19, verse 41 through 44. Some of the, some of the saddest verses in the, Old, in the New Testament when Jesus wept over Jerusalem and he said some words uh, to the effect that if you knew the time of this, your visitation, he, he prophesied that their destruction would come destruction of Jerusalem, which would come in 70 AD, and it did happen, it wouldn't have happened, he said, if you knew the time of this thy visitation. So they missed their visitation. That generation did. They didn't know some things. And so I don't want to miss anything that God has for me. That's why we're teaching all these things. That's why we're teaching the Word of God. We need to look in and learn some things from the Word of God. So we don't want to miss out on anything good that God has for us especially in these times, amen? So it can be good or bad, number one, or good and bad at the same time, and it can be missed if we're not uh, aware of it and not uh, involved. And also, our cooperation is necessary. Our cooperation of faith is necessary for us to receive 
all that God has for us in, in a visitation, in a supernatural visitation. It requires your faith, amen? According to your faith, be it unto you. It won't just come to you just because God wants it or just because God has made certain good things available to you, and he has, amen? You have to believe and receive and expect it, amen? And when you expect it and believe and receive it, that's when good things begin to manifest from God in your life. And they are coming in your life. Amen. And I hope that you've listened to these last four teachings. These, I'm, I'm, I, if I do say so myself, this has been a very good teaching. This has been some uh, uh, just great. I've listened to myself and been blessed myself at, at this own teaching, my own teaching. And so I've, and I hope you've added your faith to it and you've laid hold of it. And I hope this teaching has raised your expectation that God's got some good things in store for you. God's got some good things coming your way and he's got some good things that he wants to manifest and to bring into your life and, and to use you and to bless you in a, in a tremendous way, even beyond what you've asked or what you thought. Amen. And so you can receive that. And I hope that your faith is getting stirred up and you're taking it by faith. Amen. That God has come to visit. And we are, and we are this is also a review. We, we're asking the question, what can we expect? Well, we said, number one, from the book of uh, Genesis, the story of, of uh, I'm sorry, the book of Exodus, the story of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, uh, that visitation of the Lord brought, number one, an end to affliction. God said, I'm gonna bring an end to their affliction. That's why he visited them in Egypt, was to bring an end to affliction. Affliction is anything that causes pain, distress, grief, or misery, either physically or mentally. And you might be in a situation today where something in your life, a situation or a circumstance or some, some, some sickness or disease or some financial situation has caused you to have um, uh, pain, distress, grief or misery, uh, mental or physical. God said, I'll bring an end to that. I'll bring an end to that in this time. If you, re if you receive it in this time of supernatural visitation, God said, I'm going to bring an end to that. It's not my will. It, it has happened and, and, and it's come upon you. But God said, it won't stay and it won't last in your life because I've come to visit to bring that to an end. Amen. And bring a change to that. And he did that in, for, for the children of Israel. Uh, we saw from Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. Uh, through three, when God comes to visit. We saw from the example of Abraham and Sarah. That's when they gave birth, or Sarah gave birth to Abraham's child, Isaac. And it was after 24 plus years of waiting and believing. So we saw the fulfillment of long awaited promises. The Bible says that God visited Sarah and she conceived and gave birth. So a, now, now it was not a birth like, it wasn't a conception like Mary's, uh, a, a supernatural conception in that way. But between Abraham and Sarah, when God visited, Abraham was able to do what it took to produce a child. And Sarah, Sarah's body, which was, uh, her womb was, uh, had been uh, barren for all her life. But now she was able to carry a child and deliver a child supernaturally. So she did that. Amen. Glory to God. So in the visitation of the Lord, so... Um, uh, the, the fulfillment of long-awaited promises. They've been waiting a long time for God to fulfill that promise. And you may have been waiting a long time for certain promises, dreams, goals, desires, something that God has given you in your heart that you would do or that you would be or that you would have or that you would accomplish in your life. And it seems like that now, like for Sarah and Abraham, now it's most impossible. Now it's, it's so absurd, it's so, it's so out of the way, far away, impossible. It seems like it could never happen. That's how it was for Sarah and Abraham until God came to visit, amen? And that's how it might be for you. It might look like it ain't never gonna happen, it ain't never gonna manifest. God said, in this time of visitation, God said, my power will bring it to pass and bring it to pass what he has promised and what he has said, amen? Regardless of what the experts say, regardless of what the doctors say, the, the lawyer said, or the people on the, whoever or has said, the circumstance says, God said it will come to pass and it will be fulfilled. Glory to God. We also said that the resurrection of dead things happens because uh, the book of Romans says that Abraham's body was dead, unable to produce. Sarah's womb was dead, 
before Isaac was uh, conceived. So the, the deadness of Abraham's body, he was not able to physically do what it took to produce a child. Uh, Sarah was not able to carry a child. Uh, so her body, her womb was dead. Well, God calls that dead. When something's not functioning and producing the way it's supposed to, God calls it dead. Well, at some point, there must have been a resurrection. Amen? When God came to visit, there must have been a resurrection because Sarah carried, <clears throat> uh, Sarah's womb was, was healed and Abraham's body was, was, uh, was, was resurrected. Glory to God. To, to able to do what it took. And uh, so we can expect the resurrection of dead things. Amen? So that's dead parts of your body. You might have a, you might have a, a heart condition today where your heart's not functioning, or your kidneys are not functioning, your pancreas, you got sugar diabetes and your pancreas isn't functioning. Well, that part of your body is dead. God said, when I come to visit, I'm gonna heal that. Man, I'm gonna bring healing to that part of your body that's not working. Now, you release your faith and receive that. You say, yes, Lord, I receive healing for my eyes or my ears or, or whatever part of your body that's not functioning is dead. God, you can resurrect that. Amen. You can bring life to that. Like you brought life to Sarah's womb and Abraham's body. You bring life to this part of my body and make it work the way it's supposed to work. And God said, I'll do that when I come to visit. Amen. Amen. You might have dreams that are dead, hopes that are dead. God said, I can resurrect your dreams and bring them to pass. It's not too late. It's not too late. I'll resurrect your hopes, your business, your, your marriage, your relationships. Amen. Things that have died. Amen. We said that the resurrection of dead things happens. And also, uh, we said that uh, an end to shame and an end to humiliation happens when God comes to visit. God doesn't want you to live your life in shame and humiliation uh, by what bad things happened in the past or bad situations that you went through. Some bad things happened to you or, or are happening to you. God said, that's, you're not going to live in that shame forever. Because when I come to visit, like Sarah, she was in humiliation and shame in her barrenness until God came to visit. Amen. And when God came to visit, that was all gone. Amen. That shame and humiliation left. And it's going to leave you too. And the last thing we saw from that example of uh, Abraham and Sarah is when God comes to visit, laughter fills the house. Laughter comes to the house. And laughter, the name Isaac, they gave birth to a son. His name was Isaac. The name Isaac means laughter. God said, I want my people to laugh. I want my children to laugh. I want you to laugh and be happy. God said, I'm going to fill your mouth with laughter. You may have been weeping, especially in the last year, uh, what, we, what the world has gone through last year and, and, and what you've gone through and experienced and things you've lost and things that have happened to you. But weeping have, may have come to your house and, and may be in your house. But God said, I'm going to replace that weeping with laughter. And then when I come to visit, it's going to cause you to laugh. He's going to reverse things. He's going to change things. He's going to bring bring things to you. Amen. And he will yet fill your mouth with laughter. Glory to God. Amen. Good days are coming. Days of laughter are in your future. You're not going to weep and cry like Sarah did. I'm sure many a night Sarah cried in her barrenness. Many a night she cried herself to sleep thinking that, oh, if I could just give my give birth to a, a child like God. No, oh, but God, when, that, when God came to visit, guess what? That happened and the laughter came. Amen. And the laughter is coming to your house too. Glory to God. Amen. Now, last week, we talked about uh, from we went from we came from Luke chapter seven, verse eleven through sixteen. That's the story or the account of when Jesus did a miracle that I, I love. This miracle that Jesus performed it's my favorite miracle that's recorded in the Gospels that Jesus performed. That's when he raised the the young man at name. He raised him from the dead. A widow's son had died in the city of Nain, and the Bible says Jesus saw that funeral procession taking place and he came and he, he just interrupted it and he, he he stepped in and he saw the mother weeping there he was moved with compassion and the bible says he raised that young man from the dead gave him back to her mother and said don't cry anymore woman don't cry anymore glory to god amen and uh, <clears throat> and and at the end of that miracle in luke chapter 7 and verse 16 you know what they said 
They said how the people marveled after Jesus did that miracle. They marveled and they said how that a prophet is risen among us and that God has visited his people. God has visited. So they saw that raising of that boy uh, as a visitation of the Lord. So when God comes to visit, I say, well, yeah, Lord, I see that dead things are right. You, you raise the dead when you come to visit. You raise dead things. And the Lord said, yeah, but look a little closer at this scripture. And so last week we looked a little closer and we saw that this miracle that Jesus did in raising this boy was number one, unexpected. It was unexpected. Jesus did something unexpected. And he said, when I come to visit you, I'm going to bless you in an unexpected way. I'm going to give you unexpected miracles. Yeah, there are some things that you've been believing for and you have asked me for and you've been standing for and asking and believing for, but there are certain things you haven't even asked or thought that I'm going to step in and I'm going to do. This, this nobody, nobody that day at that funeral procession when it was taking place, nobody, Jesus' disciples, that's the people that were around. That's the widow woman. Nobody expected Jesus to do what he did when he raised that boy from the dead. But he did it anyway. And God said, I'm going to do some things that you weren't even expecting me to do by way of blessing. Amen? Number two, we said that was unsolicited. That miracle was unsolicited. That means that nobody asked Jesus to do anything. He just stepped into the situation and took charge and, took, and did that miracle. That widow woman didn't see Jesus there and say, hey, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. My son is dead. She didn't say that. She didn't know he, she didn't know he was there. Jesus was just watching the funeral procession going by like everybody else was watching respectfully there. And he has stepped into action. Jesus said, there are some things I'm just going to step into. I'm just going to step into some situations in your life and I'm just going to take action and I'm going to fix them for you, and I'm going to resurrect them for you, and I'm going to uh, 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 bring my supernatural power to bear in your life, even though it, you didn't even ask me to do it. Amen? He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. He said, I'm not going to limit myself to what you have asked. That's powerful. Because we, we, we know that the Word of God we, teaches us we're supposed to walk by faith and believe God's promises and some things. But some things you didn't even know to even ask for and believe for. God says, I'll still do those two, two because I've come to visit. Amen? It was unsolicited. No one asked Jesus to do anything, but he did it anyway. Amen? It was uncommon. It was uncommon. Jesus did a number of miracles. Ray, uh, uh, blind eyes, deaf ears, uh, a lame walking, he did healed multitudes like that of those ailments, but we only have record that he only raised three people from the dead. That was Jairus, Jairus's daughter. That was Lazarus, and that was this boy from Maine that we have record of that Jesus raised from the dead. So it was an uncommon miracle. Jesus said, "When I come to visit you." I'll do uncommon things, amen? He's looking for, he's going to do some uncommon things in your life. Uncommon things. How about something that God's never even done for anybody ever? Can you believe, you know, God can do something for you and your family that he has never done for anybody, anywhere, at any time or place, amen? When he comes to visit, he can do that, amen? Raise your expectations. God is, is out to do, he's looking for some. His eyes are going to and fro over the whole earth looking right now for somebody to believe me, somebody to add some faith to this thing and say, yes, Lord, I believe that you can come visit me and give me this miracle or that miracle, even though I've never seen anybody, I don't know anybody else who's ever done, had this, but you can do it for me and God will do it for you. Amen. Glory to God. Uncommon. Amen. He did this miracle we said last week was untraditional. It was untraditional. Jesus broke the rules. <laughs> he broke the rules of protocol. He broke the rules of order. In those days, like in these days, you do not interrupt. You do not interrupt the funeral procession. Jesus just interrupted it. Did you hear that? He brought the whole thing to a stop. The music's playing. The people are crying. They're, they're carrying the body through the streets. Masses of people are all around watching. Everyone's watching. Uh, either you're mourning with the people or you're just quietly in, in, in respect, allowing them to pass by. But Jesus pushes his way through and just grabs the coffin. That's untraditional. 
A rabbi coming that close to a dead body? That's untraditional. Rabbis would never come that close to a dead body because they didn't want to become ceremonial and clean and happy to touch. But Jesus has grabbed the coffin and said, stop the whole thing. They stopped the procession. He just stopped the whole thing. Amen. That's untraditional. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Jesus said, when I come to visit, I'm about to do some untraditional things, amen? I'm about to break some orders, some rules like that that you guys are used to. You're used to certain things. And I'm speaking to some pastors out there. Guys, I'm coming to visit your church. When I come to visit your church, you know, I know you like to have your, your order of service. And first thing we do is here, we have a greeting. Then we have an opening prayer. And then we have a scripture. And then the church mother greets us. And then, no, 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 Jesus said that. No, no, I, when I come to visit, I set the order. I come in and I determine the order and I come in, I'll, I'll disrupt your order. Well, I thought that things are supposed to be done decently and in order in the house of God. Well, yes, they are. But sometimes we know from the word of God, God's idea of decent and in order is a little different from our idea of decent and in order. You study the scripture. Amen. When Jesus does things orderly for him is when he went to the synagogue. He went to the temple there and he overturned tables and, and, and whipped out some people, made a whip and be, the people were buying and selling in the temple there. And he just began to over, he snapped. He snapped in the temple and, and whipped some people around and overturned tables and drove them out of the temple. That was orderly as far as God was concerned. That was, that was God's order. <laughs> Amen? Amen. So when Jesus does things, uh, it's, sometimes things are a little different. It look, order from God's perspective is different from, from, from our perspective. And Jesus said, when I come to visit, I'm going to go against your tradition, what you say, the rules that you've established and that you've set. I'm not going to be limited and, and, and governed by those. Amen? Glory to God. I'm stirred up. Amen? Why? Because God comes to visit. And when Jesus comes to visit, he just takes over the situation. He took over a funeral procession. He just, he just brought the whole thing to a stop. You know, you know what else Jesus came, when Jesus comes into the house and comes to visit, he just takes over. Remember when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead? The Bible says he came into the house and they were all around crying and bawling and squalling and slinging snot and, and mourning over, over the girl. She's dead, she's dead, she's dead. And Jesus walks in and he says, what's the big to do? The girl's not dead, she's asleep. And they said, what? They said, what? They laughed him to scorn. Jesus said, you laughed, you laughed me to scorn. You know what Jesus, the Bible says Jesus did? The Bible says that when he put them out of the house, read your scripture. I used to think that he put them out of the room where the girl was. She might have been in the back room dead there, and they were all back there crying. And no, no, Jesus didn't put them out of the room. The scripture says he put them out of the house. That was Jairus' relatives. That was Jairus' kinfolk. That was the, the people. Jairus was a well-to-do established man in the community. It was some uppity people that were there uh, and, and relatives and, and friends and, 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 and people uh, uh, come to grieve and mourn over Jairus' daughter. Jesus comes into the house. When he comes in, he just takes over and begins to put everyone out. That word put. You know what? When it says that Jesus put them out of the house, that word put is the exact same Greek word when Jesus says, when the Bible says that he drove them out of the temple. That word drove is that same word put. It was just translated put. It means that Jesus wasn't nice. When he drove them out of the temple with that whip, he wasn't nice about it. He said, you and God, get out of here. All of you, get out. He was red-faced and angry. Amen? When he did that, when he put them out of the house, he, did, he didn't politely ask them to leave. The Bible says he drove them out of the house. Amen? Why? Because he comes to visit. And when I come to visit, I take over the atmosphere. I take charge of the situation. And, and if I say you got to go, then you got to go. Amen? I don't care who you are. Amen? Glory to God. That's order as far as God's concerned. Well, why? Because Jesus had come to visit. And after he had drove them out, then he went back in the room. He took a couple with him and went back in the room and raised the girl from the dead and presented them back to her family. He said, get her something to eat. Amen? Glory to God. That great miracle. Why? When God comes to visit. When God comes to visit. Amen? He takes over the order. Amen? He takes over the atmosphere. And he's going to take over the churches and the, and the, and the meetings and, and, and glory to God because there's a visitation of the Lord upon this generation. And God said, what was, has gone on is not going to go on. 
much longer. Glory to God, because he's come to visit. Amen? So that, that was this is all still review from last week. I was kind of getting stirred up. I feel stirred up right now. I better calm down so I can get through this little review and then get get into the get into the teaching. So so when God comes to visit, uh, he does things that are that are untraditional, also undeserved. Why did he raise that? Uh, we're back in where we were back in the, the story of the raising of the boy at Nain. Why did he raise her? She didn't deserve. Why did he raise that boy? The Bible says he, he did it because he had compassion on the mother. He had compassion on her. He was moved by compassion. She didn't say because she had done so many good works. She had given so much. She was such a good woman. It's just because he loved her. And he's going to move in your situation. You know why God wants to move in your situation? Just because he loves you. Just because he loves you. That's what motivates him to do anything and everything he does for you. Not because you deserved it, not because you earned it, not because you tried so hard and because you're trying to be the best. I mean, not that all those things are good that you're trying to be the best person you should be and you should, but his grace and his mercy, his love for you motivates him to do everything. He gave us Jesus. God so loved the world. Why? Because he, he gave Jesus. Amen. He, just because he loves you. Amen. And he wants to heal you because he loves you. He wants to deliver you because from an addiction because he loves you. And he will do that when he comes to visit. Amen. Glory to God. And the last thing we said last week about that story in the in the in the, in the book of Luke about the raising of the boy at Nain was that it was unhidden. The Bible says there were many of Jesus' disciples that were there. There were many people of the city that were there, and there were many people in that funeral procession. All the peoples converged and saw that great miracle that Jesus did. And he said, when I come to visit you, and the thing I'll do in your life, the blessing I'm about to bring you, is not a blessing that's gonna be hidden, but many people will see how, you, how blessed you are. Many people are gonna see my hand, my supernatural power, bless you and help you in a way that you couldn't, that, 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 you, that people will know that it was God that did that for you, amen? It will be unhidden, glory to God. We're speaking about when God comes to visit. Now. That was all review. Now we're going to get into one last teaching, and I'm going to turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 65. Psalm chapter 65. And we're going to we're answering the question still: what happens? What can I expect when God comes to visit? Psalm 65 and verse 9. This is what it says: Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Do you hear the A part of that verse again? You visit the earth and water it. Thou greatly enrichest it with, with the river of God. So I was reading that verse right there, but I was reading it in my, my daily devotion. I was reading it in the NASB. That's the... That's the uh, uh, New American Standard Version of the Bible. In the New American Standard Version of the Bible, this is how it reads. Verse 9 reads, You visit the earth and you cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. Hear that? It's you. It's about you as God. He said, God will visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. When I saw that, my eyes got real big, and I said, Lord, I see. When you visit the earth, when you visit, overflow happens. When God comes to visit, overflow happens. Overflow. You visit the earth, and you cause it to overflow. So what can we expect when God comes to visit? In this time of supernatural visitation in the earth, what can we expect? We can expect overflow. Overflow. I'm going to read the definition of the word overflow. The definition of overflow is this. Overflow means excess or surplus not able to be accommodated by an available space. Did you hear that? Overflow is excess or surplus which is not able to be accommodated by an available space. It means to flow or to run over or to spill over. Hear that? Overflow means to flow or to run over or to spill over. It means to flow beyond the brim, its banks or its borders. Ooh. God said, I'm about to overflow. 
in the earth. He visits the earth and he causes overflow. When God visits, overflow happens. His, things begin to run over, spill over. Things go beyond the brim, beyond the banks, beyond the borders. There's excess, there's surplus that's not able to be accommodated by an available space. Amen? Now, when you and I think of the word overflow, at least when I think of the word overflow, I think of like, I think of like a river or like a stream in, in a flood season, in flood stage, when it overflows its banks. And, and, or I think about something tragic, like remember Hurricane Katrina happened uh, many years ago and it devastated New Orleans. It just devastated New Orleans. And, and that, that hurricane, when it hit, it wasn't so much the hurricane that, that did the devastation, but it, what that caused the devastation wasn't just, just the rain and the winds, but it's when the, the levees broke in around New Orleans, the levees broke. And I went down there, my wife and I did, uh, went down to visit some people in New Orleans, and we did a Katrina um, tour. We toured the areas that, that, that were most devastated by Hurricane Katrina. And it was just, it was terrible. And to this day, to this day, um, New Orleans has not recovered completely from Hurricane Katrina. It was that devastating because there was an overflow of water. When the levees broke, certain areas were just flooded and overflowed with water. It caused many pe people to lost, lost their lives, their businesses, their homes were just destroyed. And it was, so it was a tragic thing when you think about overflow. Also, so that's what we think about when we think about overflow. Or when we think about overflow, we think about something like, something like uh, waste. Like, like my daughter, my granddaughter came to visit the other day. And, you know, she, if she wants some Kool-Aid or she wants some milk, she, she might try to pour it herself. We won't let her pour it herself, a, a cup of Kool-Aid, because we know that it's going to end up on the countertop. It's going to end up, she's going to pour too much, and it's going to overflow, and it's going to cause a mess, and it's going to cause waste. And so we think of overflow, we think of a mess being made, and we think of waste happening. And uh, so those two things come to our mind when we think of overflow, overflowing of Kool-Aid or milk, or just an overflowing a tragic uh, a river or stream or, or the, the levees like New Orleans breaking. And uh, that's not what God thinks about when he thinks of overflow. When he talks about overflow. He says, when I come to visit uh, the, the earth, and cause it to overflow. He's not talking about overflowing in bad things. He's talking about overflowing in good things, in everything good. He's talking about just bringing in abundance. Abundance is God's nature. Do you know that? We serve a God of abundance. He's a God of abundance. He's a God of too much. Like Dr. Jesse Duplantis, he's from New Orleans. Dr. Jesse Duplantis says that God is not enough. He is too much. We serve a too much God, and he is a God that brings abundance of all things good, anything good. Amen? And so, and that's what he wants to overflow in your life. He wants to, you to overflow in all things good. Amen? I'm going to turn to the book of John, chapter 10. The gospel of John, chapter 10. And I'm going to read a scripture to you. I'm going to read John 10.10. 10. John 10.10, 10, very familiar scripture. Jesus is speaking. And Jesus says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And it's understood here that the thief he's talking about is the devil. The devil is the thief. The thief, the devil comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it in a more abundantly. Jesus said, I'm not like the devil. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You know, that scripture is so very clear and it's so very obvious that we have to have some help to misunderstand it. You know, there are things that, that God has been blamed for in the earth that have happened in people's lives that comes under the category of stealing, killing, and destroying. You know, something bad happened, a house burned down, or, or a, a child died, or some sickness and disease 
is in the family. These things are not good things. These things are under the category, they can be categorized easily under the category of stealing, killing, and destroying. If, if it's stealing, killing, and destroying, Jesus said that's not the work of God. But God has taken the blame and give, been given the blame by a lot of people, even people who are people of God, people who are, who are Christians and love God, but they just don't know some things from the Bible. And, that, and so they, they blame God for bad things that happen in their lives. Something tragic happened, an airplane crash. Oh, we don't know why God did that. What? People were destroyed. People were killed. That wasn't God that did that. That here, this is the thief did that. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen? So if it's, a, if it's abundance and it has to do with life, that's, that's what Jesus came to do. He's not trying to hurt you. He, he's not the one stealing, killing, and destroying. He's the one bringing life, an, an abundant life. Now I want to read that same scripture out of the classic amplified version. There's a scripture, there's a part here I want you to get. The classic amplified version of John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came, Jesus said, that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. You hear that? When God comes to visit, he said he causes the earth to overflow. Overflow with what? Devastation and, and, and turmoil and, and destruction? No, 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 no. Here, he says, I want you to have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. That's what he wants you to have is life. Jesus, I came that you might have life and have it. I don't want you to just, just to have a little bit of it. I don't want you to just have a touch, a little sprinkle, a dash, a, a, a touch, a, a, a little bit. He said, I want you to have it in abundance until it overflows. Glory to God. Now, that word life right there, you know there are several words in the Greek language that, that were translated life, like the word bios. It was translated life. The word bios, that, that's not speaking about, it's not, it's not this word here. Bios is speaking about this, your physical body. We get the word biology from that, you know, the study of life, your life. But this word right here, when Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, it's the Greek word zoe. It's spelled Z-O-E, Zoe, Zoe. Jesus said, I've come that you might have Zoe, and not just a little bit of Zoe. I've come that you might have life, and that you might have it abundantly to the full measure, to the full, until it overflows. That word Zoe uh, is a better translation. It, it means, it, it's been translated life, eternal life, everlasting life. But it actually is talking, it's not talking about just you living forever in heaven. That's what we've always wanted to relegate to. Oh yeah, I, I have eternal life. That means I'm gonna live forever with Jesus. And that's true, you're gonna live forever in heaven when, 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 you, when you die, but that's not what he's talking about. That word Zoe is, trans, is, is def, defined as the God kind of life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have and enjoy the God kind of life, and that you might have it until it overflows. It's, it's the life as God enjoys it and God knows it. Amen? The God kind of life. The kind of life that God lives. You know, God lives very well. He has a good life. He has a good life. It, he, and he wants you to experience and to know and to, and to have Zoe, that same kind of life, the same quality of life that that he has and he is. It, it includes uh, all things good. He's full, he's heavy with all things good. That's what Zoe is. It includes joy, it includes peace, it includes happiness, it includes healing, it includes prosperity, it includes victory, it includes all things good that God has and that God is and that God enjoys in life. He's, Jesus said, I've come that you might have and enjoy it until it overflows. 
Glory to God. We're talking about overflow. When God comes to visit, he said, I, I want overflow. Overflow happens when I come to visit. So we're living in a time of visitation of the Lord. So God said, I expect you to overflow in Zoe. My people are going to overflow in Zoe. They're going to have more goodness manifested than they know what to do with. Too much of my goodness manifested in life. Too much peace. Too much joy. Too much healing, prosperity, uh, your provisions, your needs met, victory, glory to God, until it overflows. Amen. He wants you to overflow. Glory to God. He's a God of too much. That's just his nature. That's just the way God is. He doesn't know any other way. The biggest, one of the biggest lies ever told on God is that he is stingy. He doesn't want you to have a, not, a lot. He just wants you to have just enough to get by. He's a, he's a, he's a God of, 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 of you know, he's tight-fisted. He's hard to receive from. And when he does give you, he just gives you just enough to get by. That's the biggest lie ever told on God. If you read the scripture, you know what I'm saying? Anything you say, anything you believe, needs to be backed up and supported by scripture. And the exact opposite is true and told us of, of, of God. He is not a stingy God. He is a God of running over. He is not a God who's going to give you just enough to get by. He's a God that's inclined to give you too much. His, 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 he's, he's, more, he's more apt to give you more than enough, more than what you have to, than you know what to do with, than, than to not give you enough or to give you just enough. That's just his nature. He's an overflowing God. That's what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that. Now, when someone says, well, God never promised to give you what you want, only what you need. They have not read the scripture accurately. You haven't read, you haven't read it? I'm, I'm going to turn to a very familiar psalm, the most familiar psalm in the whole Bible. This psalm, my mother taught me this psalm before I went to school. I was four years old when my mother began to teach me this psalm. Psalm 23. It's a, the psalm of David. It begins like this. Verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. Look at this, verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over overflow. David said, my cup runneth over. If he had said my cup was full, I'd be saying, hey, bless God. That's good. And full. That's the way we think. We think, in fact, we think if it's, you know, if it's a, you know, three quarters, perhaps. No, but God said full. And he didn't say full here. He didn't say three quarters. He said, it's running over. That's what David said. He's the God of overflow. That's the way God is. Amen. And he said, my cup. What do you got that word cup right there? You know, when we think of cup, we think of, you know, a, a drinking, you know, something to drink out of. And, and that, that's true. But, you know, uh, David, this whole, is talking about a covenant. Covenant. This is covenant talk. When he says, you prepare a table before me, he's speaking of covenant. You have a covenant with God. A, a table is where provision is made. God said, I'll meet your needs. I'll provide for you at, at my table. You eat at my table. In, in here, and it says, anoint my head with oil. Oil is a type of the Holy Ghost. But here he says, my cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. That cup speaks about covenant provision. Covenant provision. God said, the, the, covenant, the covenant, David said, the covenant provision that God has provided for me, that God gives to me, it, it's not enough. It's too much. It runs over. You know, you know cup. We, like one thing, when you see the word cup, like when you see the word bread. Remember at the Last Supper, Jesus broke the bread. He took the cup. He was establishing covenant with those men at the Last Supper in the New Testament there before he went to the cross. 
That's covenant talk. Here, David said, bread, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Bread speaks of covenant provision, but also cups speak of covenant provision. David said that, that the covenant provision that God will provide for his child, he said, it's not enough. It's too much. It will run over. Why? He's the God of overflow. He doesn't know how to give enough. He doesn't know how to give just enough. He just, he's more inclined to overdo it. Well, someone said, I know we get to heaven. It's going to be glorious. And there's going to be streets of gold and good things and happening in heaven and happiness and joy in heaven. But read, read the scripture again here. Thou preparest a table, covenant provision, before me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. It ain't talking about heaven. Why? You ain't got no enemies in heaven. Your enemy, the devil, is here in the earth. You encounter him in the earth. He's not going to be in heaven when you get there. When we get there, he's not going to be there. He's not invited, not welcome. He won't be there in heaven. So in the presence of your enemies, there's a table. In the presence of your enemies, he's anointing you with oil. In the presence of your enemies, your cup of covenant provision is running over. Then he says here in verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Glory to God. Goodness and mercy. God's goodness, that's what you, he's, he's going to cause to overflow in your life. He's going to cause his goodness to overflow, and he's going to cause his mercy. That word mercy is the Hebrew word hesed, which means grace, uh, covenant love. Amen? Compelling love that he asked for you. He said, he said, it will follow me. That word follow right there actually will be better translated hunt or to pursue. God said, I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to hunt you to be good to you. I'm going to hunt you to show you goodness. I'm going to hunt you to pour more into your cup and it causes it to overflow more. Amen? Why? Because he's the God of overflow. And God says, in the time before the catching away of the church, before the catching away of the church, see, I'm prophesying about teaching at the same time, so it's prophetic teaching. And, and before the catching away of the church, the, the, the church of Jesus Christ in the earth will know the God of overflow, the God of abundance, the God of more than enough, the God who just has more than enough. When the children of Israel, I was just reading it not too long ago in my Bible readings, when they came out of Egypt and they went into the wilderness, you know, they came out of Egypt by the hand of God in that visitation with silver and gold, not one feeble among, among their tribes. They got out there and they did some things and they learned some things. But then they began to build, a, uh, by the instruction of God through Moses, they began to build a tabernacle for God. And they took up a collection to build the tabernacle. Hear that? God's people, Moses called and said, that, I want the people of God to bring offerings. You bring offerings to, to, to build the tabernacle of God. They call and, and they, they begin to take an offering. And the people begin to bring gold. And they begin to bring silver. And they begin to bring uh, a costly uh, 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 jewels and, and, uh, of gold, gold and silver and different jewels and different uh, fabrics that were very expensive that they got from Egypt. And they brought it to Moses and they begin to pile it there. And Moses had to send out a decree and say, stop it. You guys are bringing too much. You're bringing too much. Read the Bible. He had to tell them to stop bringing because they're bringing too much. God said before it's all over, the church of Jesus Christ will know in the earth. See, that's, that's, that that happened in the Old Testament. That happened in the Old Testament. When God's people, their hearts were stirred and their hearts were, were uh, stirred to give to God and they brought to God too much. You know, and we, there's been a problem in many churches and many ministries and the problem has been that they haven't had enough. They haven't had enough to get their job done. They haven't had enough to preach the gospel. There are certain nations that could be won in a very short time if they had the money to, 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 to pour into those nations to, to get the gospel there. But they haven't, we haven't had enough. But God says, oh, but before it's all over, the people of God who know me, that serve me, and let me visit them, I'm going to visit them and cause them to overflow in such a way that they will bring and they will give. And when they get done giving and bringing to the house of God, they will not be enough in the house to get the job done. There will be too much, too much. Don't you tell me that God did it in the old covenant and he can't do it in the new covenant. Don't tell me that, dear. Amen. 
So that's what we have coming. When God comes to visit, God says, there'll be overflow. Overflow of what? Overflow of joy, overflow of peace, overflow of laughter in the house, overflow of miracles, overflow of miracles. I prophesied miracles. God said the day of miracles hasn't passed. No such thing as a day of miracles. There's only the God of miracles. And when he comes to visit, miracles begin to overflow. Glory to God. Miracles overflow. His presence overflow. Glory to God. Glory to God. Salvation, souls begin to overflow. People you never thought would be serving God. People you thought was just, uh, that, 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 that brother, I, I don't ever see that person. or well, those kind of people getting saved, those are the kind of people that God said in, in the time of overflow, overflow of souls, salvations, amen, deliverance, glory to God. When God comes to overflow, when God comes to visit, there is overflow, overflow, amen, glory to God, overflow. He's, that's just his nature. That's just his way. God doesn't know when to stop. Seriously, he doesn't know when to stop. When he, when he, when he first met Peter, when, when he first met Peter, when Jesus first met Peter, he, he borrowed Peter's boat to do some preaching. He preached out of Peter's boat, and then he said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch of fishes. And Peter took the boat out deep into the water, and, and he, he reluctantly did it. He said, Lord, we've been fishing all night and haven't caught anything, but now Jesus is in the boat. And he says, launch out and let down your nets. I'm in the boat now. I've come to visit. He threw the net over there, and the Bible said he caught so many fish that they filled the boat, and the boat began to sink. So you know what Peter did? He beckoned to his partners who were on the shore there to bring their boat out. They filled their boat with, with fish. Their boat began to sink. Hear that? that? That sounds like too many fish. Sounds like overflow. What happened? God came to visit. Jesus came to visit. And now we are now where we have no fish. Now we have an overflow of fish, so much so that I'm sinking two boats. I'm sinking your boat with fish, Peter. Why? Because I come to visit. That's the same God that we serve. Amen. That's the same God that's alive and well in the earth today, that's moving by his supernatural power in the earth. God says, over, he doesn't know when to stop many times. He's gonna give too, he gives too much. He blesses too much. Amen. Amen? Two, two times we have record of that Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes. We have two records, two accounts separate, that he multiplied loaves and fishes, a few of them, to feed multitudes of people. Thousands upon tens of thousands in, 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 in one instance of, of people. And the Bible says that in both instances, they took up baskets full of leftovers. Why? Because he made too many fish. He multiplied too many. He made too many loaves and too many fish. In the Bible, they had too much. The Bible says they, they ate until they were all full. But in one instance, they took up 12 baskets full of leftovers. They, they, these baskets weren't little hand baskets you can hold in your hands. These baskets were baskets that were this high. It was the same basket that Paul, in the book of Acts, was let down in Paul. A man actually got in one of those baskets and was let down over it. So it lets you know that it, it, it's big enough to, to, to hold a man. Amen? But 12 of them were full. Why? J Jesus, didn't you know how many fish and how many loaves them people could eat? Why you make so much? He's the God of overflow. That's all he knows. When he comes to visit, he doesn't know how to, he doesn't know how to underdo. He just overdoes it. Amen? And he's about to overdo it in your life. And he's about to overdo it in the church. Too much. There'll be the glory of God, the presence of God, overflowing in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? In the Old Testament, the glory of God was so strong that the priests couldn't even stand to minister in the house of God. And I believe that we are the latter house. And the Bible says the glory of a latter house will be greater than the glory of a former house. So therefore, we got some overflow of glory coming to the house of God. Amen? I'm going to stop. I'm, very, I'm stirred up. But we're talking about overflow and what we can expect when God comes to visit. And God, dear, God wants to visit you. God comes to visit you. All you have to do is say yes. All you have to do is say yes. And you might have a deficit right now. You might have not enough of what you need for, you might not have, you might not have enough money to meet your needs. You might not have enough uh, strength in your body. You might, not, you might need healing in your body or whatever you need. God said, when I come to visit, don't worry. I'll over, you'll have too much, too much. 
too much health, too much healing. Amen? Too much of abundance. And you, you can not just be blessed yourself and have your needs met, but now you can be meeting other people's needs. Glory to God. That's the God of overflow, and he's come to visit. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, it's so simple. All you have to do is say a simple prayer like this. Just say, Dear God in heaven, I... I, I, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and that Jesus rose again from the dead. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. And when you pray a prayer like that, he'll come into your heart and he'll save you. Amen? Now, what you need to do is just begin to get into a Bible-believing and teaching church that will teach you the Word of God and begin to visit with God. Begin to pray and believe him, and he's going to bring overflow into your life. He's going to visit. Amen? And good things are in your future. I am Pastor Chris Turner, the pastor of Rock Tabernacle, and we call this message, this teaching, Building on the Rock. God bless you.